We start in Russia, where 24 hours after the end of a short-lived rebellion posed the greatest challenge yet to Vladimir Putin's authority, the president's whereabouts remain unknown. There's been speculation that the Russian leader fled Moscow during the crisis after his presidential jets were tracked leaving the city. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the events show the cracks in Mr Putin's authority. Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner mercenary group pictured here, leaving the Russian city of Rostov-on-Don on a Saturday evening, is reportedly going into exile in Belarus after abandoning his advance on Moscow. <laughs> and with Wagner forces firing their guns into the sky and cheers from the watching public, his troops also de departed the city. Tensions had been building between Mr. Brogoshin and Russia's military leadership for some time over their approach to the war in Ukraine. Our Russia editor Steve Rosenberg reports. Leaving as heroes. The Wagner fighters pulling out of Rostov last night. You'd think they'd just won a war. The leader of the mercenary group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, was off too. He'd just done a deal with the Kremlin to end their mutiny. The rebellion started here, then spread north. It was the biggest challenge to Vladimir Putin's authority since he came to power. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Russia's commander-in-chief likes to project an image of strength. A mutiny on his watch is embarrassing. But is it damaging? For Vladimir Putin, Will there be political fallout ahead of next year's election? He definitely uh, looks weaker. All elite groups will begin to think about the presidency 2024. Should they rely, as they did even one week before this uh, military coup, on Vladimir Putin? Or should they think about someone new. But there's no sign yet that someone new in the Kremlin is Mr Putin's plan. Vladimir Putin is determined to show that he is in charge, in control in the Kremlin. And he has the Russian state media to help him paint that picture. The trouble is, the dramatic events of the last couple of days have raised questions about how in control the Russian authorities are of the situation here. Instability. Russians can feel it. The rebel Wagner fighters may not have made it to Moscow, but people here were watching nervously and waiting. I'm a mother with three children, Anna tells me. Of course I'm terrified by what has happened. We were scared these events would spread to Moscow, Nastya says. There's nothing ordinary citizens can do to influence the situation. It's decided above our heads. Many Russians tell me that. They don't believe they have the power to change what is happening in their country, to make their voices heard, to turn things around. Steve Rosenberg, BBC News, Moscow. Well, America's most senior diplomat, Antony Blinken, has been speaking following yesterday's events in Russia, saying the revolt exposed real cracks in President Putin's authority. I think uh, we're in the midst of a moving picture. We haven't seen we haven't seen the last act. We're watching it very closely and carefully. But just step back for a second and put this in in context. Sixteen months ago, Russian forces were on uh, the doorstep of Kiev in Ukraine, thinking they'd take the city in a matter of days, thinking they would erase Ukraine from the map as an independent country. Now, over this weekend, uh, they've had to defend Moscow, Russia's mm -hmm. capital, against mercenaries of Putin's own making. Uh, Prigozhin himself, uh, in this entire incident, has raised profound questions about the very premises for Russia's aggression against Ukraine in the first place, saying that Ukraine or NATO did not pose a threat to Russia, which is part of Putin's narrative, right. and it was a direct challenge to Putin's authority. So this raises profound questions. It, it shows r real cracks. We can't speculate or know exactly where that's going to go. We do know that Putin has a lot more to answer for in the, in the weeks and months ahead. Well, our North America correspondent David Willis told me from Washington that Antony Blinken had been diplomatic in his answer.
He chose his words very carefully indeed. These were the first comments by an official of the Biden administration since the crisis broke out in Russia. And uh, Anthony Blinken chose those words, as I say, very carefully indeed. What stood out for me is that he clearly believes that uh, the revolt that we've seen in Russia over the last uh, day or so uh, presents an opportunity for the West in the same way that it presents a challenge for Vladimir. Vladimir Putin and uh, he also made clear did Mr Blinken that there is a lot that the West and its allies still don't know. They include the whereabouts of Vladimir Putin himself, the whereabouts of uh, Mr. Prigozhin, and also where this whole crisis might lead, what it might uh, end with. It's a moving picture, Anthony Blinken said on one of the talk shows this morning. Asked about President Biden's remark last year that this man, a reference to Vladimir Putin, cannot remain in power, uh, Mr. Blinken was particularly diplomatic. He said that's a decision for the Russian people. It's not our business. It's not our purpose. That's up to Russia and its people. I think uh, the United States, its allies, very keen, Samantha, to make the point that uh, they are not to be seen to be meddling in internal events in Russia or seeking, of course, to inflame them. Yeah, and obviously everybody's waiting to see how and what impact this could have on the war in Ukraine. Are there, are there any thoughts there yet as to how this could impact on the U.S. relationship with Ukraine? Well, it's a key question, isn't it? And uh, the uh, President uh, Joe Biden has been meeting before he left for Camp David yesterday with members of his national security team. That includes the U.S. Uh, Defense Secretary. It includes the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the uh, chairman of the CIA, the very top defense and intelligence officials here. And President Biden also convened a call involving the leaders of France, Germany and the U.K. UK, following which a statement uh, was released affirming the unwavering support for Ukraine. Anthony Blinken separately spoke to a G7 leaders. So that question that you posed, how this affects the war in Ukraine, how it affects NATO, key to those discussions which are ongoing and will be uh, for the foreseeable future, I think. David Willis there. Well, joining me now live are Leon Aaron, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institution and author of a new book on Vladimir Putin, as well as John Lechner, researcher and freelance journalist writing a book on the Wagner Group. Uh, gentlemen, lovely to have you with us. Thanks very much for being here. Um, Leon, if I can start with you, what does the events of the past 24, 48 hours mean for Vladimir Putin and his control over his country? Um, he looks um, weakened. Um, the three constituencies that he has, the people, the army, and the political class, all seem to be at best indifferent. Um, in the case of the people, um, instead of waving Putin's portraits and Russia's flags, uh, in Rostov, which was taken by the Wagner Group, um, they gave uh, the troops uh, water and candy and uh, photographed with them. Uh, we have not seen a single political leader uh, backing Putin publicly. And of course, the army melted away um, before um, the Wagner Group. Now, uh, probably the symbolic damage to Putin is the greatest. Look, he addressed the nation calling um, um, this a treason and calling this, um, uh, calling without naming him, calling Prigozhin a traitor. Well, after you imply treason, uh, a treason and calling somebody a traitor, you do not forgive them. You do not uh, and let them go into a peaceful exile into a fraternal country next door. He looks definitely deflated. Yeah, so let's pick up on that, John. Um, Prigozhin has been let go, it seems, for now. It looks like he's going to go into exile in neighbouring Belarus, but we haven't actually heard from him, and he's previously been extremely vocal. What do you think the immediate future holds for him? Um, it, it, it's difficult to hazard a guess uh, at this moment because, I mean, as your reporters have been saying, the, the situation is extremely fluid. We simply don't know uh, where, where he is right now. Um, if, if he does show up in Belarus, I think a lot of folks are skeptical that uh, he will just kind of go off quietly into, into retirement. 
And uh, even if he does show up in Belarus, there'll be a lot of remaining questions. Is, is he still head of the Wagner organization? Will Wagner continue to exist uh, in its present form? Or uh, is his move to Belarus kind of significant in terms of uh, new management for the organization? Well, let me ask you some of those questions as an expert on the Wagner Group, um, because it is the creation pretty much of one man of Prigozhin, and a lot of them seem to have loyalty to him, didn't they? He created a cult around himself almost. What do you think is going to happen to those um, people who have served him and this militia force, not just in Ukraine, but also around the world, very much in Africa as well? Sure. Um, I think, you know, first of all, we have to we have to think about whether or not we're going to see any significant changes at the top of management. And thus far, we, we can't say uh, for certainty that we will. Um, that being said, you're right. Uh, Goshen has created a, a certain loyal base within the organization. But at the same time, it's safe to say that that there are others within the organization who, who were uh, caught off guard by this move and, and perhaps didn't necessarily agree with it uh, and, and did not want to be put in this position. Um, and so if there were uh, a change in management, I think as it pertains to Africa and, and elsewhere, uh, it's difficult to see uh, other individuals within the Russian government or other Russian institutions wanting to dismantle the infrastructure that Wagner has put in place in, in Africa, like Central African Republic, Mali, uh, Sudan, and Libya. And so I think uh, if there were a change in management, what we would likely see is something not overnight, but, but a very kind of slow change of personnel rather than a dismantling or a withdrawal of, of forces. Leon, uh, experts on Vladimir Putin often talk about him having a playbook, a certain way that he'll react to events. He often, when threatened, doubles down, doesn't he? Do you think he saw this coming in any way? And how prepared may he have been for this? And we obviously haven't heard from him for quite a few hours now after he addressed the nation. Well, and also he waited uh, too long. He waited for 24 hours. Look, in the authoritarian playbook, you usually address the nation after you defeat the enemy, preferably showing uh, on the video the execution of the enemy. Um, Putin here is not uh, uh, looking very decisive. I think he waited this long because he was trying to gather the troops. He, he was trying to see if he could actually uh, smash uh, uh, Prigozhin uh, militarily. Um, he could not, and he did not. And it's interesting that um, uh, in his uh, address to the nation, he no longer uh, used the trope that he always used, which is this is like the Nazi invasion in uh, 1941. He said this is like the October Revolution of 1917. Well, in October Revolution, um, uh, the Bolshevik took power with uh, two regiments and uh, four uh, uh, armored vehicles. So I wonder if Putin uh, subconsciously or consciously um, tried to, to uh, forestall this kind of uh, outcome. And yet it appears that if uh, Prigozhin and Wagner had gone on to Moscow, <laughs> uh, Putin would have trouble uh, finding uh, troops to protect him. Yeah, John, which begs the question, what deal do you think was done to ensure that Prigozhin backed down, walked away effectively? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think uh, first and foremost, it, I think it's important to, to differentiate whether we think uh, Prigozhin was out to commit a, a coup and house Putin from power or whether or not he was doing a very uh, particularly naked short sure a show of force, but one which was an appeal to authority to oust his rivals internally, specifically within the Russian Ministry of Defense. Now, I tend to think that it's actually the latter, and that uh, this was a particularly bold attempt to prevent himself from being subordinated to his main rivals uh, within the Russian government itself. And I think that he probably uh, saw events kind of uh, move away from him and, and from his control as well. And we don't know exactly what, what was in the negotiations. There's speculation uh, that uh, there, there might be some sort of uh, repercussions for individuals within the Ministry of Defense who, who are rivals of Prigozhin, uh, Shoigu and Gerasimov, for example, uh, or that uh, Prigozhin was just given an off-ramp 
and, and an ability to, to, to go off uh, and, and actually uh, have retirement and see, see his fighters uh, under amnesty. I think if we see significant developments within the Russian Ministry of Defense in the coming days, then we'll have a more clear picture of what negotiations were taking place.